Today on The Nation Speaks, mass shootings. Is media coverage a contributing factor? How should we cover these killers? Tom Teves lost his son Alex 10 years ago, and he's been on a mission ever since. Then in America Q&A, we ask if you think the media should report in detail on every mass shooting. Next, Professor Greg Perot studies news coverage of these events. He thinks no notoriety is the only way to go. Finally, in our second America Q&A, do you think the usual format for political debates works? Hello and welcome to The Nation Speaks. I'm your host, Cindy Drucker. Mass shootings often come in clusters. May this year was particularly traumatic. In Buffalo, 10 people were shot dead in a supermarket. Then a week and a half later, the unbelievable tragedy at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. 19 children killed, third and fourth graders, plus two teachers and another 18 injured. In what the head of the Texas Department of Public Safety calls an abject failure in policing. Then a July 4th parade in the Chicago suburb of Highland Park was stopped cold by a rooftop gunman. He killed seven and wounded 25. Think for a moment about these episodes and others like them. There's a good chance you can recall more about the killers than the victims. And that's a direct result of media coverage, which some people argue is part of the problem. That's what we discuss with our two guests today. On July 20th, 2012, 24-year-old Alex Teves and his girlfriend went to a midnight screening of Batman, The Dark Knight Rises. In the dark of the theater, Alex and 11 others were shot dead. 70 more were injured. Alex was a big superhero fan, and then he became one, shielding his girlfriend Amanda from the bullets, sacrificing his own life for hers. In the aftermath, Alex's parents came to some realizations. Putting aside complicated issues like gun control and mental health, they realized that lives could be saved just by changing how we in the media cover these events. I sat down earlier with Alex's dad. With us now is Tom Teves, Alex's father. Tom, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Tom, Alex was killed exactly 10 years ago this week, so I, I can't imagine it's an easy time for you and your wife, Karen, and the rest of the family, or frankly, the whole community. I'd like to start by giving you a chance to honor your son before we jump into the wider issues. What would you like us to know about Alex? Alex was somebody I think the world could use right now. Um, Alex was a collaborator. Alex brought various groups together. He was very athletic and he was a wrestler. He always wore a white shirt, a white t-shirt and blue jeans to school every day when he was in high school. And when his mom asked him why, he said, because I don't, I just want to be neutral. I don't want to take any position. And the seniors in this particular school, they have what they call Pride Day and the school would sell them shirts for, you know, they were they were official high school T-shirts that everybody would wear. And the year they were going to do it, the school doubled the price. So the entire class revolted. And instead of doing that, the entire school, the 475 students in his class, decided to do it as Alex Eve's Day, and everybody wore white T-shirts. So he was just a collaborator. He brought people together. And I think if you think about the way the world is today, we could use that. Indeed, that's a really wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so going back 10 years to that totally horrific time, can you, most of us fortunately, have not been in your position. What was it like to experience the media coverage of that when it immediately happened? Um, well, in the beginning, when it, you're not ready to get a phone call that, you know, your son's been murdered. You know, we got a call from um, his girlfriend saying that there was a shooting and that, you know, she couldn't get Alex to wake up and that they dragged her out of the theater. And I unfortunately knew right then he was dead because I knew who Alex was and there's no way he wouldn't have got off the floor. We were about 3,000 miles away. Unfortunately, at the time, we couldn't get anybody um, in the police department to answer the phone, which is understandable. They were literally dragging, you know, 
very hurt people to the hospital in their police cars because they were run out of ambulances. And when we turned to the news, all we saw were pictures of the murderer and his booby trap apartment. And it, it became clear as we got went through the 3,000 mile trek to get back to Denver because we were literally it was the first day of our vacation in Hawaii. It just became apparent that there was something wrong with the way the coverage was going in that all we ever saw was pictures of the murder. And when we got to Denver, we tried to keep a low profile, but all of a sudden stories were being made up about Alex that no one had said. So we had to we had to at least address it. So we ended up on CNN with Anderson Cooper and I just challenged him. I said, you know, can you guys go 12 seconds without saying this coward's name? Because he's not a hero and you got to stop turning him into something he's not. He's a coward. He snuck up behind a bunch of people with an automatic rifle and started shooting them while they were watching a movie. And, you know, that resonated with Karen and I. We started doing the research and we realized that if you do the research and you can go on our, our website, nonotoriety.com, and you'll see the only thing that connects all these shooters is the desire to be noticed, the desire for infamy, the desire for notoriety. You can do all the research and we, we very much ask you to do all the research. And we never want to infringe on anybody's First Amendment rights. We do not say don't say the name. But we say, if you have to say it, say it once. If you have to show a picture, show a picture where these things usually end up. They're almost always suicidal, so they usually end up in the morgue. So show a picture of them in the morgue. Or if they do get caught, like unfortunately the person who shot Alex did, they're in chains. So show them in chains. Don't show them in some staged photo that these these cowards set up that they could never really do in real life anyway of making themselves so menacing because a menacing human being doesn't sneak up behind you with with a semi-automatic rifle and shoot you in the back of the head because once you do that you will see these these situations reduce and the real life model unfortunately or fortunately was 2020 because in 2020 you had the dual issues of the pandemic and a very very contested presidential election that essentially sucked all the oxygen out of the room and you didn't see mass shooting. As soon as all that started to clear, they started again. There's really no reason not to do this. I've read articles in six paragraphs that the name of the individual who shot my son was mentioned 41 times. If I was a journalist professor and you turned in a paper like that, I would fail you for redundancy. So no one's saying that, but just minimize the infamy you give these people and you'll take away the largest motivation they have. And anybody who comes on you and said, we've done the research and that's not true, they're telling you something that's false because every expert from law enforcement to the, psycho to the, the psychiatric community agree with us that that is the single greatest motivation.